Okay, you ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. All right, three, two, one, let's go. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. In this episode, I speak with Gerald Rushton, senior member of the QIS structuring team at Macquarie Bank. Our conversation largely revolves around commodity strategies, including thoughts on trend following, commodity carry, commodity congestion, and commodity volatility carry. Gerald argues that the latter three are particularly well suited to be paired with equity hedging strategies, and we spend quite a bit of time discussing the major design levers behind each approach. Gerald also provides some insight as to how QIS desks have evolved over the last decade, why he believes QIS desks can provide unique edge, and the many ways in which they can customize mandates for clients. Please enjoy this conversation with Gerald Rushton. Gerald, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Excited to get what I think is going to be a pretty differentiated perspective in this episode. Thanks for having me, Corey. Excited to be here. Well, I would love to just begin with your background for the audience who maybe doesn't know who you are or doesn't have maybe a lot of context for Macquarie as a bank, particularly US listeners. Maybe you can do a little bit of table setting for us. So my name is Gerald Rushton. I started my career at Lehman Brothers working in subprime mortgages. And you guys may have heard that ended pretty badly for everybody. So at that point, I needed to find a new career. I'd studied computer science, pretty quant guy, so found out about systematic investing. I've been doing that ever since. So at Macquarie, which is a Australian investment bank, I work as part of the QIS structuring team, so quantitative investment strategies. And what we do is we research, design and implement systematic trading strategies across all asset classes. What does that mean? Well, like how the S&P 500 has a weighting scheme and rules to determine the level, the rule being market cap weighted. We build indices that have maybe different weighting schemes and different underliers, trying to implement things like trend carry value across the different asset classes. And then clients can access those products in the way you can access any index product, a swap, an option, a fund, an ETF, you name it. You can get as exotic and funky as you like. We can do it. So I'm going to come out of the gate swinging a little bit here maybe address the elephant in the room, which is that bank QIS desks have historically had a bit of a mixed reputation when it comes to launching systematic strategies. There's a number of cases where you sort of get that classic up and to the right index goes live and then it flatlines. Why do you think this has historically been the case? And do you think that QIS desks have evolved over time to address this problem? Definitely come out swinging there. So you're referring to the, the hockey stick profile. As you said, the back test looks amazing. Then you can pinpoint the day the index went live because then it starts trending down. And I think there were a lot of examples of that in the past 10 years or so ago. But nowadays, I don't really think that's the case. I think there's a couple of things to say about that. One, everyone has been guilty of a bit of back test overfitting the past. When you're a bit younger, a bit naive, your expectations are not particularly grounded, then you're going to make some mistakes. I think one of the disadvantages we have as a QIS business is that we're very transparent. You can see the performance of every strategy that we launch. And so, of course, it's easy to find a few indices that have the hockey stick and point at them and make a few checks. However, I'd say the industry has really evolved in the last decade or so. So as a way of background, the big kind of boom in QIS desks happened after the publication of what's known as the Three Professors Report by Ang Gertzman Schaefer, which was basically commissioned by Norges Bank, the sovereign wealth fund of Norway, to basically ask the question, what happened in the GFC? We thought we had diversified, but we still lost a ton of money. And they basically said, well, you're not really 
been following the literature and the developments we've had in finance. And there are other factors that we're missing, things like trend, carry, and value. So at that point, a lot of the Nordic pension schemes started looking at these types of strategies and looking to banks to implement them. And maybe 10 years ago, there was a bit of a rush to fill out the so-called risk premium matrix, maybe a little bit of equity quantitorism, where people apply the classic decile long short approach to the macro asset classes, where it's a little bit less of a valid approach, I'd say. But nowadays, we have plenty of very serious people in the business, people publishing in top academic journals, and we have a lot more experience. I would also say the clients are a lot more sophisticated. They ask a lot of tough questions. They want to see all the rigorous analysis about parameter sensitivity, how you've come up with these models. So there's definitely been a big evolution. And I think as a whole, the industry is doing a lot better now than it was 10, 15 years ago. Part of the problem with the last generation of QIS indices was maybe an over-reliance on academic work or an attempt at directly porting equity quant strategies. I love that phrase you used, maybe equity quant tourism was going on. Maybe you can contrast that to where new ideas are coming from today. I think back then there was maybe a view that you couldn't deviate from the literature, that what was written in an academic paper was almost some kind of God-given truth. And the only changes you could make were to restrict the universe to the tradable instruments, for example, and maybe add some transaction costs. So I think trend following was an interesting case there, where prior to the publication of Time Series Momentum by Moskowitz and all, there was a bit of skepticism about it, despite the fact that the CTA industry had been implementing trend for decades very successfully. Nowadays, people are much more open to ideas that have not come from the academic literature. The porting thing is, is definitely a bugbear of mine as a macro guy. And here we're talking about the idea that you need to be essentially dollar neutral. You need to rank things and go long the top X, short the bottom Y. And in the macro space, you know, we have fewer instruments that are tradable. We potentially have higher correlations in things like rates. And also we have very wildly different volatilities. Like if you think about commodities, like the vol of nat gas and the vol of gold, are really not the same. So in a long, short, decile type strategy, if you're long nat gas, you've got a nat gas strategy, unless you're a little bit smart about risk taking. And so, yeah, like how trend was kind of validated by the literature and has become a staple of QIS desks, other hedge fund like strategies are now the staple of QIS desks as well. And we get those ideas from our trading desk and speaking to clients and just trying to think. How do you think operating within a bank provides an edge to the types of strategies you can deliver for clients versus, say, the strategies a hedge fund could deliver? So I think really technology and sitting inside a global investment bank is where our edge comes from. There are a lot of strategies that it's just not practical to run without that tech and trading capability, like something like commodities volatility carry, a strategy where being high touch, selling options every day, multiple different strikes, delta hedging multiple times per day across a whole range of commodities, it's a pain. You need a lot of traders, you need a lot of data, you need a lot of models to do that. So what a lot of our clients face is not a limitation in terms of their kind of intelligence or understanding what they want to do, it's just purely operations. And so being within a bank, trading is our bread and butter, that's very easy for us to do. And a lot of these strategies, significant edge does come from being high touch. There are also slightly more boring reasons why we have some edge, which is that it's something kind of Rob Carver talks about in his books. You can't run some strategies in small size because of the contract sizes. The size of the JGB contract is like a million dollars. So you're not going to get kind of very refined position taking unless you have very large notional. Also data. We spend millions of dollars a year on data. We spend millions of dollars a year on our tech team. It's all very expensive to run systematic strategies well. The other advantage I think we have is that because we're working very closely with these smart clients, we're essentially almost crowdsourcing some ideas from them and refining our ideas. Whereas in a hedge fund type setup, you might be working with a much smaller group of individuals. And so that kind of questioning and probing that we get from clients helps us improve the models. In our pre-call, you mentioned that over 50% of the strategies you trade on behalf of clients are actually customized. 
Can you talk maybe to the sorts of strategies clients are looking for today and some of the ways in which you're able to customize them? So luckily at Macquarie, we're privileged to work with some really smart clients and we work very closely with them. We're sharing code, Evans and Python. And these guys, as I mentioned, they know what they want to do. They've got really good ideas. They just can't execute it. So we'll develop a model with them. It could be a trend following strategy. It could be a carrier strategy. There's many, many things we can do with them. And once we've kind of finalized their custom trend program, for example, we can put that in production and run that for them. And that's obviously going to give everyone much better outcomes, better outcomes for them because they get the product that they want a much better outcome for us as a bank because those trades are obviously likely to be a bit more sticky. People are going to stick with the program they designed. Whereas if it's an off the shelf program, they might just get out the trade as soon as it starts going wrong. There's other much kind of lighter customization that we can do. So maybe you want a different volatility target. Maybe you can't trade agricultural commodities. All of these kind of smaller light touch customization is possible too for relatively small size compared to what is offer in the asset management community due to the just the fixed costs of setting up funds. Trend following as a strategy is at the forefront of everyone's mind nowadays, particularly after last year's performance of stocks and bonds. And cross-asset trend has historically been a staple for most QIS desks. This is a strategy that's now being pitched as positive sharp, crisis help of providing an inflation hedge. And I know that you take some umbrage with this, particularly the crisis alpha part. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a soapbox. What's wrong with CTAs today? First off, just want to make it clear. I really, really love trend following. I think everybody should have it in their portfolio and I don't have any problem with CTAs. What I have a problem with is maybe the way we've been pitching trend as an industry. As you're saying, the pitch is just so good. It's pretty high sharp positive skewness, does well in an equity crisis, it does well in an inflation crisis. What's not to like? I mean, it'll even tuck you up in bed with a bedtime story and give you a glass of milk. It really is the ultimate strategy. I think the issue there is a lot of the pitch is not true if you've not been very thoughtful about how you've built the trend following strategy. And in particular, you start looking at the evidence. We're pitching trend as an industry, including my past self, as a crisis hedge. But what happened in Q4 2018? Well, trend following was down. What happened in the acute period and stress in the COVID era? Well, trend following was down. So I was quite sure that when we came up with the idea of crisis alpha, that it was supposed to be a positive alpha, not a negative alpha. So we've got a bit of a problem here. And that has led to a lot of disappointment from investors and a lot of mockery in the media. As an aside, this is not obviously investment advice. If you do see an article in the FT saying quants bamboozled by markets, that I'm pretty certain has got a 100% hit rate in terms of the time to get max long trend following. Someone should write a research paper about that. So you can build trend to give very different payoffs with the same kind of rules. People nowadays have been talking about faster trend following and more long-term trend following. And those strategies have very different payoffs and you need to understand the kinds of goals when you're pitching them trend. What are they really looking for? What does even a crisis mean? Some people really do care about a really bad week. Some people care about a really bad year. And we need to make sure that the client's expectations are met by the trend following program we have provided to them. One of the other issues that I have is the famous convexity chart. So everyone's seen it. You plot quarterly returns of S&P 500 versus quarterly returns of the CTA benchmark. Choose your favorite. I like the new edge one. And you see this lovely Strava-like profile and you say, hey, and also remember the Fung and Shea paper, the risk in hedge fund strategies. Trend is like a look back straddle. QED, it's long vol, it's a hedge. The issue is, if you look at the data over the past 20 years, it's just not true. So yes, you plot the quarterly returns of S&P versus the new edge index. You do get a straddle. This is not a robust result. You remove a single point, you remove Q4 2008, the whole story disappears. It's no longer convex when you're looking at the CTA industry as a whole. Of course, there will be people who still look convex, and I would bet that those guys are doing shorter term trend following. In our deck, we have a chart which really kind of blows people's minds when they see it, which is plotting the skewness versus sharp ratio of cross asset trend following. So 
one day trend is following or let's say one year trend following. And what you see if you do that exercise, which is also a bit alarming, is trend becomes negatively skewed when you start looking at trends over six months. It's got a great sharp ratio, but it's no longer this positively skewed convex terrorist hedge that we've been pitching as an industry. The other issue I have with the way as an industry we've been pitching trend is really in our explanation of it. Like, why does it work? So there's a lot of papers about their behavioral aspects, you know, the underreaction and then subsequent overreaction to news, the institutional lags that can exist in absorbing that news, creating that effect, overcrowding, herding, all these kind of things. And then there's also some truth to that. But I think what we're not talking about is there are also rational reasons why trend following could exist. Think about Euro dollar futures or now SOFA futures. Those are really just tracking the policy rate of the Fed. And what is the Fed doing? Well, it's reacting to the business cycle and inflation, and those are very cyclical. If you check the quarterly changes in CPI, it looks like a random walk until you condition it on the previous change. And so if the last quarter CPI rose, the next quarter there's an 80% probability that it rose. Like there are trends in the economic cycle and the Fed is reacting to those trends. Now, maybe this is a question, why do they not react faster? Well, if you read Ben Bernanke's essay on central bank gradualism, you'll understand that there's a reason why central banks are cautious and act gradually, and it's basically long and variable lags. So I think as an industry, we just need to do a better job of communicating why trend following is a great strategy to have in your portfolio, but also make sure that we're giving people the right type of trend following for their objectives. Anyway, I should probably stop now before getting in any more trouble. Well, one of the things you mentioned there was the ability to customize the payoff profile of trend following. And one of the things we often see trend following strategies that are particularly pitched as being crisis alpha trend strategies is they impose different limits to explicitly trying to create negative betas to equities. So for example, you might see them impose constraints that they can never be long equity index futures or that they could never be short bonds. Given the desire to create a payoff profile that is convex during periods of equity crises, do you see these sorts of constraints as ultimately being useful? I think it's a really good idea. The issue is it's fraught with danger. Estimating betas is hard. Like We know that. How are you going to define your covariance matrix? Are you going to use shrinkage? The estimation of covariance is such a complex topic that when we go through our monthly review of all the academic journals, our team finds two, three, four papers on better ways to do it. Now it's about intraday data. It's about using machine learning. So it's a hard thing to do. And one of the issues with this is that we know that these betas can change. And the problem with using it in a trend following program, in my opinion, that's supposed to be a hedge is that the time these betas change is a crisis period. It's kind of changing at the exact time you need it to be super accurate. So I think it's a good idea, but if you're not doing it well, it's going to be potentially backfire. And I think that's quite a bad situation to be in with a client, right? It's different in my opinion that if your trend following estimation of beta goes wrong and you take a big loss, that's a very bad outcome. Whereas if you were trying to say just beta hedge your portfolio or something like FX carry, which is highly pro-cyclical, and it goes wrong, you're probably still going to significantly reduce the drawdown and the client's probably going to be quite happy. So I think it's a great area of research and a good idea, but if it's done poorly, not so great. I think trend, you should let the data speak for itself. It's very rare that we have a true exogenous shock. Even COVID, we knew about it really three months before the market. So I think it's better to just focus on making sure your implementation is robust in terms of having the right kind of signals, the right kind of rebalancing rules, and the right overall risk taking, than trying to be a little bit too smart. I think for most institutions and perhaps individuals, the holy grail is finding a strategy that can provide that convex hedge that we're looking for, and then pairing it with a strategy that can carry positively and offset the bleed of the hedge. And the risk, of course, is choosing a strategy that carry strategy that blows up at the same time. The hedge kicks in, ultimately negating any benefit from the hedge. Curious what sort of strategies you think might fit in this bucket. This is the million dollar question right now. 
We're working with clients in every single region on this question. Broadly speaking, obviously people can buy puts, but that's very, very expensive. So people are turning to statistical hedges and shorter term trend following is a statistical hedge. There are other ones like rates vega, intraday trend following. There's a whole bunch of ideas out there that have shown good returns in crisis periods. The issue with this is with the exception of say rates vega, they're gonna probably carry negatively. And that makes it hard to live with. What I've seen in my career so far is people put these hedges on, it bleeds for one or two years, and then they decide to take it off or their managers tell them to take it off or their board or whoever it might be. And obviously the moment they do that, it works really well and there's a crisis. And that's just the way life is. So we as quants probably think of ourselves as hyper-rational beings that would never ever do such a thing like that, but that's not really the world we live in. So what we've been trying to do and, and others is to pair these negative carry strategies and suggested with positive carry strategies. And we find that commodities markets are really an interesting place to be looking for these sources of returns because things like commodities carry and congestion, they have pretty good performance through time and the times that these strategies underperform don't always coincide with equity beta, basically. So you're not likely to blow up at the same time. And so that's the kind of space we've been looking at. Obviously, the story doesn't end there. You then need to think about, well, how do I size these two legs? And we've done a lot of work on that. But in terms of the strategies, commodities, I think, is the best place to be looking. Let's dive into some of those strategies. And maybe let's start with commodity carry. Can you Provide an overview, what is commodity carry, why you think it fits the bill of this sort of positive carry strategy that maybe is less correlated with equities. And then I hate doing multi-part questions, but here we go, this is a multi-part question. I would love to know from your perspective what the major design levers are that can influence the return profile of this sort of strategy. Commodities carry, it's not a strategy that's particularly well covered in the literature. And it's basically a curve strategy. And so the simplest implementation would be something we would call F3 versus F0 carry. And for example, you would be short the August WTI contract and long the November WTI contract. And you do this across the liquid set of commodities that you have. What is the point of doing this is that commodities curves are driven by basically storage costs, which gives these pairs trades of long and short contracts, different roll yields that you're trying to capture. So it's not really about a roll up the curve or carry between commodities like you might see in FX. It's really the story of roll yields. Now, even the simplest implementation of commodities carry on say a BCOM universe, it's got a pretty high sharp ratio. So post cost, you're looking at something well north of one as a sharp ratio and pretty consistent returns through time. So that makes it very, very attractive as a funding leg for these kind of negative carry strategies that we were mentioning earlier. And it is a risk premium strategy. So it's not free money, it's not arbitrage, but those risks are typically commodity specific shocks, typically to the upside. So a drought in the agricultural markets obviously can be bad for a commodities carry strategy or the invasion of Ukraine in terms of oil prices spiking. But most often than not, these risks don't coincide with the big macro shocks. And in fact, it's actually the opposite. Typically, in a big macro shock, the front end of the commodities curve, particularly oil, sells off very rapidly, giving these strategies a little bit of an extra kick in those crisis periods. So also making them pretty attractive. Now, that was pretty much the most simple implementation we could describe, the F3 versus F0. In terms of the levers, well, obviously the first question is what contracts am I gonna select? So in commodities, we have pretty liquid curves. So unlike equities where you can only trade the front month apart from during the roll period, you've got good liquidity two or three years out in most commodities. So where on the curve do you want to be? Taking longer curve spreads, so not just three months apart, is going to give you more vol, potentially more return, but it's a little bit riskier. Maybe you want to be dynamic. Why stick to F3, F0, and F6, F0? Maybe you could try and identify the best places to be on the curve dynamically. So once you've done that, you need to think about sizing. 
So do I want to be notional neutral? Do I want to be lot neutral? Or do I want to use some risk-based measure? Maybe I want to be vol neutral. Maybe I want to borrow from the rates literature and do something really funky like a PCA weighted exposure. That would be pretty cool. And so now you've got your what we would call a mono alpha. So you've got your dynamic risk weighted single commodity curve strategy. Well, how do I make a portfolio of these? What's my objective? If I want to do massive size, then I probably don't want to go BCOM or GSCI weighted because that's where the liquidity is. The BCOM and GSCI indices, their weights are basically determined by liquidity and production. But if you're less concerned about that, maybe you could think of a better portfolio construction technique. And there are obvious ideas out there in the literature about how to combine portfolios of alphas. The value add of a QS structure is that we understand what these levers are and we can help explain them to you and make sure you're getting the right implementation for your portfolio. I would imagine that one of the other potential benefits being at Macquarie in particular is that you are a commodity bank, which would mean compared to many folks on the buy side, or perhaps even in comparison to many other banks on the sell side, you have access to a larger universe of commodities. Can you provide some examples of maybe these non-benchmark commodities that you might have access to and talk a little bit about the impact of including them within trend or carry strategies? So as well as background of the listeners, when we refer to the benchmark commodities, we're referring to the commodities inside the BCOM and the S&P GSCI universe. These are the commodities you know and love, Brent, WTI, gold, copper, wheat, etc. The non-benchmark commodities are basically all the other commodity futures that didn't make the cut. And they're not particularly exotic. Like you've got things like orange juice futures. They're obviously made by famous by the film Trading Places. You have UK natural gas, European natural gas. You have London cocoa. There's a whole range and there's a good number of liquid instruments that you can trade systematically. There's also the onshore China commodities. These are still, they're not strange things, but maybe the contract's a bit more exotic to us. For example, there are egg futures, there are glass futures, there are plastic futures, but that's commodities. It's just the real world things that we use to build stuff. Obviously, the astute listener will be thinking, well, they're less liquid. They must be really expensive to trade. And luckily, that's not true. They are a little bit more expensive. There are a few exceptions that are a lot more expensive. And as I think some of your previous guests have hinted at, getting access to onshore China commodities is not easy with offshore money, but it can be done. If you take the relatively low cost liquid set of non-benchmark commodities that are outside of China and apply trend following, for example, one of the things you're going to see is you're going to have almost two and a half times the Sharpe ratio post-cost compared to what you would see in the benchmark universe. So just very standard trend following windows you know, between one and 12 months, 2.5 times the Sharpe ratio in the last 15 years. So that's pretty cool. We like that. We like higher Sharpe ratios. The question is, well, what's going on there? Why is that the case? Is that just some kind of historical fluke or is there a reason for that? And the reason isn't necessarily what I think most people think. We're using the same model, so it's not like we've got a better model. And if you look at the data, it's not really the case that these commodities are trending more than the benchmark commodities, maybe with the exception of natural gas in the last two years in, in Europe. Really what is happening is the correlation between the individual trend strategies is just much, much lower. So, okay, well, that's why I've got a higher shot ratio, but why is the correlation lower? Is that a fluke? And again, there's a fundamental explanation of that, right? Basically, the benchmark commodities are part of the asset allocation toolkit that most kind of asset owners have, and they are subject to flows from pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, etc. And so they're more financialized. And you know, there's been a ton of papers over the last 15 years or so about this topic. And you know, essentially, there's much higher correlation between benchmark commodities. And while the non-benchmark commodities remain outside of there, it's not likely that the pairwise correlation will increase. The trends in say orange juice futures are being driven by the fundamentals of orange juice. You're getting a more kind of like idiosyncratic trend than let's say like commodity beta trend. Curve carry, unfortunately, the curve is not quite as liquid. So you're gonna struggle a bit there but certainly for trend following, super useful instruments. 
as I know a number of your guests have highlighted before. One of the things we saw in the early 2000s to sort of around 2010 was that there was a large increase in the demand for commodity strategies, even just commodity beta. And one of the strategies that became popular was this idea of commodity congestion. And we're starting to see that again, as, as commodity strategies ramp up in popularity, I'm starting to hear a lot more people talk about commodity congestion strategies. Can you talk us through what is a commodity congestion strategy? And maybe once again, talk about sort of the major design levers that can influence the return profile. So you're referring to a strategy known as the GSCI role, which is a super popular commodities congestion strategy. It's been around for 25 years or so. And the basic idea is that all behind any congestion strategy is that you know of an event that is going to cause a lot of trading. I don't need something like NFP where obviously there's going to be a lot of trading, but you know the trading that's going to happen. So how do you know this? Well, you go to the S&P GSCI website, and you download the index rules of the index, and you can see what days it rolls its positions. And so if you were to know that there's a lot of assets following that particular index, then of course you could position around that and you essentially provide liquidity during the roll period and earn a pretty decent return. Now these strategies are obviously not as well known in the academic literature, they're more kind of practitioner strategies, but as you're saying, like they have been around for a long time and they exist across all asset classes. So examples in FX could be around the 4 p.m. WR fix. In rates, you could think about bond auctions. You could think about the duration extension at the end of the month. And in equities, we obviously have things like stocks entering and exiting the indices and other effects. When it comes to congestion, clearly the thing you need to know is really the intricacies of the market. Who are the players? What are they doing? Are they still behaving in the way you expect? So people don't necessarily invest in just the front month of the quantities universe now. There are such things as deferred indices where you might go a bit further down the curve. So in terms of the levers, it's obviously very strategy specific, but really the three things you're kind of adjusting are how early do you enter, how late do you exit, and how do you kind of risk manage that portfolio of congestion strategies to make sure you're not taking on other unwanted risks. And the other thing is you need to keep consistently innovating. So the original GSCI strategy, a simplest implementation in the period you mentioned, sharp ratio too easy. Nowadays, that strategy is a lot weaker, but there are ideas you can use to make the strategy dynamic, and those dynamic implementations are still performing really well. So we could probably argue that commodity carry is more of a risk premium, but congestion strategies are much more of a behavioral phenomenon and, and can probably therefore more easily be arbitraged away. How do you make sure that congestion doesn't get congested? Absolutely. It is behavioral. It is an anomaly and it can be arbitraged away. I think the issue with congestion or the advantage of congestion versus other arbitrages is that the behavior is dictated by the index rules. If you are hedging an index exposure for a client, if you don't follow the index rules, you're taking basis risk. And that's not necessarily everyone's job. So you need to keep track of the index footprint, try and measure what the flows are into BCom and GSCI and the ways you can do this. You need to think about measuring congestion returns to try and find out if it is being overtraded or not. There are ways you can track this and ways you can think about where to play congestion. So yes, if congestion itself is congested, well, maybe I could have a strategy around that. As I mentioned, we've seen a lot of consistency across the dynamic implementations, and they've generally done a pretty good job of kind of outperforming the more simple static ones. And yeah, you just have to keep innovating both in commodities and other asset classes. A good example is, as I mentioned, the FX WMR fix. So the idea here is that at 4pm at the end of the month, people adjust the FX hedges, like so global investors. And so people used to try and capture that premium just really using quite slow trading rules. You trade 4 p.m. the day before, exit at the end of the month. Well, that strategy implemented in that way has deteriorated significantly over the last decade or so, but maybe you could be a bit faster. Maybe you could trade just a few hours before the 4 p.m. fix. And that's obviously if you do that, it's gonna prevent you 
taking too much like general macro risk, which we've obviously seen a lot of in the last few years in terms of data releases and Fed speeches. So yeah, innovation is key in congestion. Taken somewhat to an absurd limit, a congestion strategy that's implemented further away from an index role in many ways just becomes a carry strategy. Can you discuss maybe how these two strategies interact and how we should think about allocating to them so as to avoid doubling up on the same risks? Yeah, it's definitely a fair point. So in commodities, both of those strategies are what we'd call short spread strategies. So there is going to naturally be some correlation. I think the key thing to, is just to first to be aware that this is what you're doing. The issue is when you start using dynamic implementations, it becomes quite a tricky exercise to think about that. And so I just think just awareness of the problem is key and, and making sure like in the worst case scenario of them both having exactly the same positions, that you're not taking on too much risk. In terms of the other issue about doing congestion strategies earlier and earlier, and that can be carry trade, I think as long as you're measuring how much of your congestion returns is coming from carry, and then you still got the congestion spirit of your strategy, it's still probably okay. And you know those returns can be quite different for different commodities as well. It's about awareness and just keeping track of what is going on and making sure you're not doubling up in the wrong times. So one of the strategies that you mentioned earlier, though didn't explicitly mention here, but something that's top of mind for you is commodity volatility carry. I'd love to dive a little bit into that strategy I maybe start with a comparison into how it's similar or different than equity volatility carry. At its core, it's the same. You are selling options at a high implied volatility that is higher than the subsequent realized volatility, and you're capturing that spread by selling an option structure like a straddle and then delta hatching that package. Also, the return profile is similar. You know, each day, you're probably earning a little bit, and then in a period of stress, when realized vol jumps, you're probably going to take a pretty big loss. So in that way, they're extremely similar. The differences come in that the tails don't necessarily overlap. Like a lot of people argue that vol carry is essentially like an insurance product you're insuring the market. And how do insurance businesses work? Well, they diversify the things they're insuring. And so commodities vol carry, there's at least eight, nine, ten very liquid commodities you can do this on, and then you could theoretically do it in the full universe, but smaller size, so up to 24. So you're getting a lot of different tail exposure, but still earning that kind of VRP, the volatility risk premium. Clearly, in a big crisis period like the GFC COVID, there is going to be some overlap in the tails. You need to be aware of that. You also need to be aware that each market has its own subtleties in terms of the players in that market and where they are active. It is not necessarily the case that the front of the curve is the best place to be in. And so, yeah, commodities can be pretty weird. It's best to go in there with a little bit of fundamental knowledge and make sure you're not making any terrible errors. So on that topic of fundamental knowledge, despite the QIS name, I know that you and your team lean heavily on your colleagues who can provide a lot of fundamental insights into these different markets. So hoping maybe you could provide some examples of how those fundamental insights make their way into the quantitative strategy design. So we're definitely not in a pure math camp, you know, where you're just kind of applying maths to data and hoping for a good outcome. We think it is important to try and understand the fundamentals of the market, not just in commodities, but elsewhere, and try and incorporate those into the strategy design. Now, when I'm talking about fundamentals, I'm not talking about the view from the research team about what will happen to oil in the next couple of months. I'm talking about the market structure, things like seasonality, information from the trading desk about who are the different players in different parts of the curve. Like in rates, we have the concept of the market segmentation hypothesis. In commodities, producers, consumers, and speculators are active in different parts, and you should be aware of this. It's really kind of like a, a form of kind of craftsmanship alpha. As you mentioned, seasonality is a pretty big part of the commodities complex. And what we mean by seasonality is that there are some commodities which have very distinct seasons. So natural gas in the winter behaves completely different to natural gas in the summer. As a lot of commodity strategies are curve-based, taking a cross-seasonal spread 
can you expose you to a risk that you're potentially not aware of? And while those risks can be measured and may have historically been compensated, we may also be suffering from a peso problem. So natural gas is a good example there, where historically it looked like taking winter summer spreads was a positive risk premium. But then in winter 2018, we saw that that may not actually be the case. So it's just being aware of what you're doing in the commodities market is not quite as simple as other markets might be in terms of the market structure. Yeah, I think for those of us coming from an equity quant background, we can be caught off guard as to how important that seasonality element is, particularly in commodity strategies. You mentioned that gas. I love to just think of the coffee example where you go long a far dated coffee contract and short a front dated contract. You could be talking about totally different harvests. They are truly very different deliverables. So maybe you th hoping you could talk a little bit more about how considerations for seasonality find their way into these different commodity strategies. How does it work into carry or congestion or volatility carry? We did touch on this a little bit in the previous answer. And really, the adjustments can be pretty simple. You don't have to go too crazy. So when we're talking about carry, maybe you just want to adjust the role schedule. So you're doing, let's say, the F3, F0 strategy I described earlier. But you know when you get to a cross-seasonal spread, you just adjust the role schedule so that you're taking a long data contract and you're no longer taking, say, that winter-summer spread. In vol carry, it can be just as simple as not selling options in those periods or when it comes to agricultural commodities. As you say, something like coffee, you may be looking at completely different harvests and the risk in those types of strategies comes at harvest time. Terrible weather, just as you're about to harvest a coffee or, or wheat or corn or whatever, can result in extremely large moves, but just for a single contract, right? So we don't have to be too complex with these adjustments. It's about being aware of where the seasonality is and deciding whether to take that risk or not. But to avoid it, you don't have to be too sophisticated. Taking a quick turn off the commodity topic here, in our pre-call, you mentioned that FX carry was starting to make a comeback after being largely left for dead post-GFC. What do you think we learned from the crisis and why is now a good time to be considering the strategy? FX carry is really having an incredible couple of years, last few years since central banks have started hiking, there is essentially just more carry to harvest. So in terms of what we learned, coming back full circle to what I was saying about the evolution of QIS desks, FX carry is one of the oldest QIS strategies out there. There are implementations from 20 years or so ago, but the construction there was really incredibly naive. You would have a G10 universe, you would rank them from one to 10, including the dollar, go along the top three, short the bottom three, equal no shot. And then you would rebalance once a month or maybe even once a quarter. And so those strategies actually did pretty well from the period of, say, 2002, 2003, up to the GFC, where essentially the equity beta of FX carry was exposed. There's also been a ton of academic literature about this and the explanations being of why this process exists are things like shocks to consumption and growth, liquidity, premia, et cetera. And so you had something which turned out to be very pro-cyclical. And post-GFC, there wasn't much carry to capture. So you had absolutely no upside pretty much. And then all the downside of equities. And obviously most clients have got enough equity beta in their portfolio already. So definitely left for dead. There are other issues with that kind of portfolio construction, which is you often high carry currencies, particularly when you look at the EM space, are having a crisis of their own. So if you're just doing, say, a simple equal dollar weighted approach, then again, like how I was talking about how net gas can dominate as a simple long short strategy, you can just have your whole strategy being driven by a single currency, which is really not great. So the latest strategies in the space are really trying to think about this. So making sure the marginal contribution to risk of any one particular currency is not too high, making sure that you have adjusted the weights to be neutral to equity market beta to make the strategy really deliver, like let's say, the pure alpha of FX carry without any additional equity beta. And by doing that, you, you can make the strategy a lot more attractive to clients because it gives them something 
a little bit different compared to those much more simple implementations. Well, Gerald, we've come to the end of the episode here, and I want to ask you the same question I've been asking everyone this season, which is about the tarot card they chose to inform the design of the cover of their episode. And you chose death, which I thought was an interesting choice. And I was wondering, what was it about the imagery or perhaps the cards meeting that spoke to you either personally or professionally? My colleagues initially suggested I go for the tower because I'm really tall. And then that, to be honest, would have been a better approach because I like to be thorough in my research and I really fell into a deep, deep black hole of, of research into tarot, having known nothing about it before. I would have saved a lot of time if I'd listened to my colleagues. And that's the case with tarot and also for quantum research, I would say. Yeah, so in the end, I did choose death really for three reasons. One, it is the most misunderstood card in tarot. It doesn't really mean you're going to die. And that resonated with me because I think quant is basically the most misunderstood strategy or at least investment style out there. And as we're doing now, I spend a lot of my time trying to demystify quant investing and get people comfortable with it because I just think everyone should be doing it. So that was the first reason. The second thing is that it also represents the change of thinking from an old way into a new way. And as I mentioned, again, that kind of resonated with me in terms of trying to get people away from that like very kind of old school 1960s, 1970s way of investing, the idea that there's nothing predictable out there, that everything's a random walk, people not being aware of the other kind of risk premium out there that they can use to enhance their portfolio, and also thinking in ways that are not supported by the evidence. We try to be as quant super data-driven and make decisions based on data and not emotion. So that also resonated with me. And then thirdly, in the image in a very specific card, so the Rider Waite Smith tarot series, the image of death features a white rose in the background. And it's a pretty niche English person answer, but basically the white rose is the white rose of Yorkshire. And as a proud Yorkshireman, that also resonated with me. So those are the three reasons I went for it. But as I said, probably should listen to my colleagues who thought, Gerald's tall, go for the tower. Well, I appreciate you putting in all the time and effort to research it. I hope it was at least fun. As fun as this episode, I really appreciated you coming on. I know the listeners will likely have learned a ton about commodity strategies. So thank you very much. Thanks, Corey. Pleasure to be here.